morning. Uh, we had a wonderful crowd. Uh, got a wonderful crowd for Bible study, and I appreciate that. And I uh, got some young faces in here, so it's good to have the teenagers in class. Um, we're going to be continuing our study on the book of James. And so now we're going to be in James chapter 2 for our fourth lesson. And that's going to be on the danger of prejudice and the way that it manifests itself sometimes in the church. And so one of the interesting things that we talked about when we talked about the book of James is its close relationship with the book of Matthew. Now, of course, we realize that uh, Jesus... Jesus uh, preached the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, that's kind of obvious. It's obvious also that James is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, we do know from the Bible that tells us that his brothers did not believe him. But Jesus would have been the paterfamilias, if you will. Um, we don't understand the concept of the eldest brother and how important that is. I mean, if you're the oldest brother in a family, like Brother Ed, I mean, you, I mean, you may, you know, have that persona of being like the best, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't say that, right? <laughs> Just better than the rest, right? <laughs> um, but in, in the first century Jewish world, uh, the elder brother, uh, especially after the father had been deceased, I mean, he was seen as the father figure today. It's Father's Day. And so in the ancient world, the idea was you were never better than your father. I mean, your father was, was the best image of you. Now, many of you would say, you know, that you, that you have sons, if you're fathers or daughters, you want your children to exceed you, to be a better version of you. But in the first century world, it was just the accepted fact that the father was going to be like the perfect image and the son would come close but not quite close. But the closest one that would would be the oldest brother. Jesus being the oldest brother would have been the paterfamilias. He would have been responsible for taking care of his mother, taking care of his younger brothers, uh, marrying off his sisters. And so it was a very important title. And so we don't know how closely the younger brothers of Jesus, the four brothers, were associated with his ministry. And the interesting thing is that we say this is because because when Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount, or preaches the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at James chapter 2, the entire chapter, and you correlate that with Matthew chapter 7, it is extremely similar. And I apologize, I had this on my, on my uh, notes and outline. I just kind of took a picture and put it on the PowerPoint. I didn't know how it would look, and it looks pretty small, so you probably can't see that. Um, but you can uh, probably go online and Google a relationship between Matthew 7 and James chapter 2. But if you look at this, you will see that the outline of Matthew 7... And and the way he closes the Sermon on the Mount almost mirrors the outline of James. Another interesting thing is that James and Matthew worked in about the same area, which would have been in Palestine. And so it's very, very interesting to see just the relationship of how closely James chapter 2 is to his brother and Lord's sermon in Matthew chapter 7. And I apologize if you can't see that, but um, some of the main themes that go uh, across each other are prohibition against judging or favoritism, <laughs> illustration of removing one's own faults so that he can help, the, uh, help remove the faults of others, um, warning not to despise what is sacred in favor of dogs or pigs. Um, and James, is, don't, don't despise brothers who are rich in the faith. Uh, encouragement to ask and to believe. Some of the law is doing it to others as you would do to yourself. Uh, James basically verbatim says the exact same thing. A summary on admonition to follow the narrow way that leads to life. Uh, James talks about the law that gives freedom. Uh, Jesus talks about warning against false prophets and, and what is true, test uh, the deeds. And Jesus, uh, James talks about warning against dead faith and that true faith that can be tested is shown by its deeds. And then at the very end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he talks about putting Christ's words into practice. And then James talks about the example of, of faith as a faith that is being put into practice. And so it's really interesting to see just how similar James chapter 2 mirrors Matthew chapter 7. And so many people have asked, well, was James there? Now, of course, James was inspired by inspiration, so James didn't have to be there. But it is interesting to see just how closely James 2 mirrors uh, Matthew chapter 7. And so um, let's go ahead and start with our first four verses. Or anybody have any questions about the relationship of James 2 and Matthew 7? No? All right, great. Let's go ahead and deal with our first four verses of James chapter 2. My brothers, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dress and fine clothes, and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes, and say, You sit here in a good place. And you say to the poor man, You stand over there or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? 
And so James is trying to contrast, and it's important for us to realize, the closing of chapter 1. Now, of course, this has been stated numerous times, and you know this, that chapter divisions and verse divisions are not inspired. And so if you read Hebrews chapter 11 in the Hall of Faith, and you don't read uh, 10, 39, and you don't read 12, 1 through 2, you're going to miss two major points of what, what the Hebrew writer is trying to say. Now here in James, we have a chapter division. I'm not going to say it's a terrible division, but it's important for us to remember uh, the very end of chapter 1 of verses 26 through 27, and also the first four verses. But what does he talk about at the end of chapter 1 in verses 26 and 27? Pure religion. Right? And here he's talking about hypocrisy. Right? So pure religion is looking on those that society maybe has outcast or sees as unworthy. He uses the illustration of, of what group of people in verses 26 and 27? Two, two main groups. Orphans and widows, right? And so he says, you know, you look on them just like God looked upon us, right? With love and care and concern taking care of you. And so then he starts off chapter 2 by saying, now let's see this in action. So if you're in a church service and you have a man that comes in with fine jewelry and he's got a lot of money, right? If you try to show him favoritism over someone who comes from a lower social class, you're not practicing pure religion. You're practicing hypocrisy. And so here he juxtaposes this uh, set of verses against the very end of chapter 1 to show us that God is concerned about how we treat people outside the assembly. He's also very concerned about how we treat people inside the assembly and to show favoritism, unwarranted favoritism to someone because of their outside materialistic value is to look at someone in a way uh, contradictory to the way that as Christians we should see other people. And so James is talking about uh, this, this religion that is shown in our actions both outside the assembly but also inside the assembly. Uh, a Christian we should be courteous and have compassion to all. We should show uh, equality, love, and fidelity um, to anyone that comes into our assembly regardless of their background or their materialistic worth. And uh, all earthly distinctions disappear when we're in the Lord. Um, there's a passage Anybody know that passage that talks about how earthly distinctions disappear once we're in Christ? <coughs> Excuse me. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Have faith, right? Weather this storm with resiliency and peace. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly right. Anybody know, remember that passage? What it is? Galatians, that's exactly right. Galatians 3, all right. Brother Smith Bauer just being, being humble this morning. He, he knows exactly what the verse is. And see, absolutely, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, right? Um, I believe it's 28. Where well, there's neither slave nor free, uh, male nor female, Jew nor Greek, for we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so distinctions, physical distinctions that we have, whether it's white, brown, black, yellow, blue, that little song we sing in VBS, right? Yellow, red, black, or white, they are precious in His sight. It's true. I mean, we've seen that, but sometimes as adults we have a hard time coming to grips with that. You know, high, middle, low income, right? They're precious in His sight. It doesn't matter. All those distinctions melt away once we're inside the body of Christ. And so it's important for us to leave those things behind because that's not the way the world works. I mean, you don't eat at the same place as Bill Gates, right? You don't drive the same car. I mean, there are distinctions based upon income. Uh, but inside the church, our worth is not valued by our net worth, right? Our worth is determined by the cost of our soul, which every person's soul uh, costs the Lord his life. And so we got to be able to let that surface level stuff go because it just shows immaturity and a lack of understanding of what God wants us to do. And so the two faults of the usher... Right? We don't have ushers here, but maybe you've been to a congregation where they have ushers. You've been to a wedding where they have ushers. Uh, maybe you've been to a wedding where the ushers actually do something. Right? You know what I mean? Like sometimes it's like, oh, we got to do my brother or my wife's brother. We'll make him an usher. Right? You know, it's just kind of like the reserve. It's like groomsman part two. Um, but um, if you're an usher, I'm sorry. I've been one too, so I don't have feels. Um, anyways. The favoritism of the rich. And so the first problem that the usher and this hypothetical first century church had done is that he had a worldly outlook. 
But when he saw someone come into the assembly, was he looking at them as a brother in Christ? Was he looking at the soul? Or was he looking at the worldly outlook? Worldly outlook. And so that says something about his own spiritual state. The fact that he's looking through the lenses of the world instead of the lenses of Christ. Now one of the things that we do as Christians, when we become Christians, we've got to see the world differently. We've got to see the way we treat other people differently. We've got to change those lenses. Now, this individual here, they haven't changed their lenses. They're still looking through a worldly lens. The second thing is, his mind is on receiving instead of giving. Now, the church is not interested on what it gets from its members. Now, don't misunderstand me. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 and 2 tells us that we have a responsibility to give to the Lord. But the church doesn't say, we're going to go door knocking in the richest neighborhood in town because they can give the most money. Right? There are some congregations who have that mentality. We don't at Chapel Hill, but I've, I've known of some, right? That's the wrong way to think about the church, right? We're not interested in what we can get from people. We're interested in what we can give to people. Eternal salvation. You can't put a price tag on that. And if the person that responds to that message is low income, fantastic. The person that responds to that is high income, it's wonderful. But to look at someone's worth or how much money and time and effort are we going to give and reaching those people as compared to these people is to show the world and to show our Lord and Savior that we're not looking at people with the right mentality, that we're, we truly haven't put off those worldly glasses and put on uh, new glasses. Um, and so it's important for us not to have that surface level, surface level prejudice. Any comments or questions about verses 1 through 4? Was Jesus concerned only about the rich people in His ministry? Everybody, Right? And from what we know from the New Testament, what was the social standing of most of the people that responded to his message? <laughs> Poor people. Statistically. Uh, yes? The common people heard him That's right. The Ha'amaritz in Hebrew. Really Aramaic. Which means the people of the land. Um, if you read the New Testament, one of the charges laid against Jesus by the Sadducees and Sanhedrin is that uh, he's, just, he's just filling the Ha'amaritz. You know, the common man, the, the farmers, right? They're just, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know the Bible like we know it. And so he's just fooling them, you know. Little did they know that it was the people of the land that actually understood the old law, its expectations, and they were the ones that were responding. Of course, you had wealthy people in the New Testament that responded to the invitation, so it's not a wealthy people are evil. I mean, you had Jason, who was uh, the ruler of the synagogue there on Paul's missionary journey. I believe it's like in Acts. Uh, it's either Acts uh, 14 or 15. Uh, no, it's not 15. It's got to be Acts 13 or 14. Um, you had people like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and so you had people who were rich in the first century, but by and large, um, the Romans made fun of Christians in the first two centuries. You can read this from Roman historians. They make fun of Christianity because they say it's a religion of slaves and women. And that's what the Romans thought about Christianity. It's, it's just it's women and slaves. The two lowest rings on the Greco-Roman ladder, women and slaves. They're like, whatever, you know. And so it's important for us to realize that Christ came for everybody. You know, and he came for the meek and the lowly, and uh, and it's important for us not to forget that whenever we're looking to see who we can bring into the fold. Any other questions or comments? No. Yes. I think even when you look at the government, and sometimes the government thinks they know what's best for us because they have all the education. <coughs> I think sometimes we just need the common people there. Yeah. The common people have more confidence. Yeah. Uh, educated fools. Right? And so, um, and I can take resentment with that because I spent eight years in college and uh, my wife will tell me sometimes, you're the dumbest smart person I know. <laughs> and I'm like, she can't get mad at me because she says that a lot. So, uh, and it's true, right? You know, but, so, uh, but sometimes, you know, sometimes you just forget common sense, right? Sometimes it's important for us just to take a step back and say, you're overthinking the problem. You know, or, or, when we discount someone because they dress differently than we do, or we think we're better than someone or smarter than someone because they're from a lower economic standing, or they have less formal education, and we think, well, we know better than they do. 
Well, that's what the Sadducees and the Pharisees did, and they missed Jesus. And so it's important for us not to have that same mentality, which James is worried about here in this first century congregation. Uh, it's, it's very important because um, uh, even today, uh, you can find all kinds of statistics online that by and large, the, the most religious population in the United States is low income. Um, countries that are in the poverty area right now are exploding. I mean, a lot of times we look at the church in the United States and say the church isn't growing. Um, the church is growing rapidly um, in Latin America and Asia and Africa. I mean, the church is, is, is exploding. It may not be as growing as fast as we would like here. We've got to work a little bit harder, but the church is growing. But what do all those areas have in common? They're poor, at least bar standards. And so it's really hard to convince somebody who lives a life of luxury that life's really bad and you need to look towards heaven and cast off all your uh, tie to your possessions here in this life. It's a hard sale. Someone has got a couple million dollar net worth. You talk with somebody who's got nothing, it's easier pill to swallow. And so, Brother Ken? Where is it in the Bible where, you know, he sends out people to bring, you know, sell the wealthy and all to come in to have this party and they didn't show up and they told us to go out and bring, bring them out, you know, bring anybody. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus uses the parable there about the, 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 the feast. It may be a wedding feast, I believe, where he, he sends out the invitations, right? And nobody's, nobody comes. Nobody's coming invitations. And so he tells them to go out and gather uh, the people that are just the outcast, downtrodden, the poor people to come to the feast. And, uh, and so there uh, he's using that parable to show the elite. What we've been talking about, those Sir, the Sadducees, those Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, thought that they were the elite, and going to get an invitation from God, and they did, and they rejected it. And so, yeah, absolutely. Now, as far as specifically what chapter that's in or what book, I don't know off the top of my head. Made me look bad, Ken. No. <laughs> but I, I don't remember what that is. But uh, if someone wants to Google search that, or, or, or if you know it off the top of your head, uh, let us know, and uh, we'll tell. Brother, Ken, uh, Brother uh, Charles. Mm-hmm. But after we finish our worship service, they feed us. Mm-hmm. And we feel so sorry that they're taking their money to feed us after mm-hmm. we finish the worship. But that's their way of saying to us, you know, you are equal too. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the way I think we should feel toward anyone. You know. Absolutely. And I... And, and and the, the individuals in the congregation that are in um, uh, Ensenada, right, um, many have gone numerous times, but there are several there that are going their first time. When you can go to a, a foreign country and worship with brothers and sisters in Christ in a different place, even a different language, um, it's very humbling to realize um, that, you know, sometimes we're very uh, narrow-minded, you know, or we're, I don't mean like we just, sometimes I think we don't realize that we have brothers and sisters who are struggling all over the world. And, uh, and so sometimes it's a good eye-opener for us to realize um, that, you know, Christ isn't just the, the Savior of the United States, right? He's the Savior of the world. And so it's, uh, it's very, very uh, encouraging and comforting for us. Good. All right. Our next few verses, uh, verses 5 through 9. Listen, my beloved brethren. Do not, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But you have dishonored the poor man. It is, not the rich who oppre- is it not the rich who oppress you and you personally drag, drag you into court? Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called? If, however, you are fulfilling the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show a partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And so here in verses 5-9, through nine, he's concerned about this prejudice. And he wants them to know this prejudice is sinful. It's not just wrong um, to look down on someone based upon their race or their income or which country they're from. It's sinful. And so it's, it's very important for us to not fall in that trap because it is so easy. Uh, God loves the poor. Um, 
the poor was extremely important to Jesus in his ministry. Mark 5, 3, uh, Luke 6, 20. Uh, God has chosen more, more poor people than rich. Uh, Luke 1, 52 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Something that you and I have already been talking about this morning is that the poor are much more receptible uh, to the gospel. And so God loves the poor. And so we've got to be sure that if we are going to try to be um, Christ. Um, tool or instrument in this world and Christ loves the poor, what does that mean for us? we got to love the poor, right? And so it may be hard for us sometimes. If we come from a certain social class, you know, if you've been upper middle class and your family's been upper middle class for the last, I don't know, four or five generations, it may feel weird to go somewhere and there's lower income people there. And so, but the Bible tells us that there's just souls who need to be redeemed just like your soul. And really, when you strip off the jewelry and the clothes and everything else, we're all just the same. We're all just sinners who need to be redeemed. And so, it's important for us to realize that if God loves the poor, that we should love the poor also. And so, he says here, is it not the rich that drag you into court? And so, it's true then and it's true today that oftentimes rich people are much less receptive to the gospel. And so, when a Christian dishonors the poor, he or she treats them exactly opposite to the way that God treats them. 1 Corinthians 11.22 and 1 Peter 2.17. And instead of favoring Christians, James reminded his readers that the characteristic response of the rich to them had been to oppress them. And so oftentimes we try to impress or impressed by people that we think are rich, whether monetarily or in status. Um, like one of the things that has happened the last couple of years, and I think it's been because of the, the Trump thing, is that there's a lot of celebrities who think that we should care or that I should care about what they think. Does anybody, like, does anybody feel that too? Like, you've got like some singer that goes on TV and wants to lecture me about this side or the other, and I'm just like, from either side, right or left. And I'm just like, why should I care? I mean, you had that one hit like 25 years ago. I mean, that was kind of good, and it's on my iPod, but I mean, you know... You know, I'm not going to listen to you about moral ethics, you know, and so, but, I mean, but seriously, and so, is it, and oftentimes we have this esteem of rich people, I mean, we just swoon, um, <laughs> my dad, uh, it's Father's Day, so I'll tell this, um, he, we were at a gas station one time, and I don't know if it was when Michael Jackson died, or before he died, or maybe he was just being crazy, or something like that. And my dad was like, I don't want to cross the street to see Michael Jackson if you, if you pay me to. You know, and it was kind of this idea that, like, you know, I don't care. You know, I don't care if he's rich. I don't care if he's the king of pop. You know, I don't care. You know, and oftentimes we are so concerned about the ideas or the views or being liked by wealthy people or people who have status and prestige. I mean, it's just, it's really, and we can all, you know, say, that's oh, not me. Well, it's got to be somebody, because if not, these people would be broke, and they're not. And so, you know, a reality, I'm got, I'm done going to rambling now, but man, like, reality TV shows, like, just blow my mind. It's like, I could care less if he had breakfast this morning with his wife and daughter. Like, it's really, like, what's going on here? And so I don't understand how that works. Yeah, I don't understand. I don't know. It just blows my mind. Anyways, sorry. I apologize. I went to rambling. But... You know, we care too much about the opinions or the views of the rich. And uh, James is telling us that if, if, we're, if that's where our focus is, we're wasting our time. Because we're putting too much time, effort, and energy into people that oftentimes are militant against what the Bible stands for. And so we line the pockets of individuals who are anti-Christianity. We spend our time concerned about the life and the dealings of individuals who could care less about the Lord and His church. When we ought to be thinking about those that we might be able to effect and have an impact on and saving their souls and less about what the Kardashians went for their spring vacation. You know, and so it's important for us to realize that we talked about that usher in the last slide about who still got the world of glasses on. Well, sometimes it's easy for us to look at that usher in the first four verses and say, well, yeah, you can't do that as a Christian. You know, what about us? I mean, are we more concerned about worldly things? Uh, impressing or being up on the latest with worldly people? Or are we concerned about trying to help those uh, who are in sin? 
And so he talks about the royal law here. And that royal law is royal because it governs everything else in the law. And so it's important for us not to hate the rich. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's not for us to be mean to the rich. But we're supposed to treat everyone with love and respect regardless of who they are. Rich or poor, white or black, American or foreign. It doesn't matter. We're supposed to treat them with love and respect. And this is a royal law because, number one, it encompasses the entire law. And Jesus asks, what is the greatest command? Right? He says, love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law of the prophets. And so it's important for us to realize we've got people to love and respect. It's also the royal law because Jesus is the king and he told us that that was what the law was hinged upon. And so it's important for us to realize that the way we treat people do matter. Uh, Lex regia, uh, regia um, is Latin for royal law. And so uh, it's important for us to realize that this, there were laws in Rome, but if it was a, a royal law, then it was, you know, you sure didn't break it. And so it's important for us to realize that, that James is here saying this is a royal law of Christianity. And we follow all the laws, but be especially careful that you follow this one, that you treat others with respect, with love, with decency, like you would want to be treated by somebody else. And so it's important for us to have that in our life. Any questions or comments on verses 5 through 9 or the royal law? Okay. Uh, this passage calls us to be con consistent in love and not just polite ushering. Uh, people of low income are to be fully welcomed into the life of the church. This passage calls us to be blind to economic differences in how we offer our ministries. The poor person is as worthy of our discipline and pastoral care and love as the person who has the means to rescue the church from its budget crisis. That was a quote from a commentary that I thought was interesting. Um, have you ever been in a situation where people show preferential treatment to the opinions of those who could give more to the contribution? Don't answer that. Uh, do you think it happens places? Probably. Do you think some people think they have more of a say because they give more money than other people? Probably. Um, if we're that person, we've got the wrong idea. You know, now, if you're wanting to have your opinion and say because you believe that, you know, we ought to follow the Bible and say, that that's, I'm, I'm good with that one. But just the idea of I get to call the shots because I write the biggest check is completely against what we're talking about here in this passage. Uh, or the fact that we think that our Christianity is worth more because we can give more to the church. Now, we ought to give our means, right? But who did Jesus praise more about giving during his ministry? Right? The widow that gave two mites, right? Because she gave all that she had. You know, uh, when Paul was talking about those whom he was impressed the most about, uh, about collecting uh, the contribution for the saints, he was more concerned about those who gave out of their poverty, right? And so uh, it's not the amount, it's the percentage, and it's also the uh, the heartfelt reasoning behind the giving. And so we've got to be assured that we have that same mentality in the church. And so uh, verses 10 through 13 talk about the mercy or the lack of mercy that we can expect if we violate these things. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. Now if you commit adultery but do not commit a murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, I've told this before, but uh, I had a Greek test one time, and I wrote this passage at the very end of my paper. Um, I said, judgment will be merciless to the one who shows no mercy. <laughs> and uh, I got my paper back, and the professor put, even the devil could quote scripture. <laughs> And uh, so, a little, little fun I have with uh, Doug Burleson at, at Freed Hardeman. He's a great guy. Um, but merciless equals no mercy. Um, we've got, if we're merciless in our dealings, we're going to be transgressors of God's law. This goes back to that royal law, uh, being kind and considerate and caring to those whom we come into contact with, regardless of their background. Now, it's, it's more than just being a good person. I mean, it's more important than just what God said we should do it, so we need to do it. No, the opposite is, is that if you don't do it, you break the law. 
And what Jesus is trying to say here is, if you break the law, you break the law. It doesn't matter if you broke the law for adultery, if you broke the law for being a murderer, or if you broke the law for being a jerk to somebody. If you broke the law, you broke the law. And you are guilty according to the law. And so the idea that we could say, yeah, I'm not a perfect person, I got a little bit of a temper, and I can be a, I can be a, you know, a rough person sometimes, but I ain't killing people, you know. Once again, are we looking at the world through our Christian glasses, that new man? Or are we looking through those worldly glasses and still hanging on to some of that? Worldly glasses. And it is, it's a struggle for all of us. And we all stumble at different times. But it's important for us to realize that this is something that's very important to God. And if it's very important to God, it's got to be important to us. The law gives us freedom. But the law will still judge us, Second Corinthians 5.10. And so do we have freedom in Christ? Absolutely. It's all over the New Testament. Do we still have responsibilities? Absolutely. And so there are some Christians that think that well, because they believe in Christ, they can do what they want. There's just this, this, this freedom, do what you want. It's not what the Bible tells us. We still have to be concerned with pleasing and obeying God. And a part of that in the first century church is not the 613 laws and statutes, but there are some laws and statutes of the 613 that are reiterated in the New Testament. Like those two that Jesus talked about. Like the one that here that James talks about in James 2. About being kind and considerate and caring about other people. And treating them the way we want to be treated. If we fail to do that, then we fail failed to keep the law. And we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And have to give an answer according to those words. John 12.48. And so it's important for us uh, to do that. Uh, no mercy to the merciless. God will judge impartially. Why should we judge impartially in the church? Because God does. God judges impartially. And therefore we judge impartially. And so it's, it may be hard, but if we're trying to be like God, if we're trying to grow in that image, that's something we've got to do. God is concerned about our actions. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. And that passage that many of you know is Jesus is closing the end of His earthly ministry as He's rebuking those in Jerusalem. He talks about how those who didn't visit Him in prison or those who didn't give Him food or drink or those who, who didn't do those things were going to go on to fire a, a gnashing of teeth for all of eternity. He said, but those who did did, you know, give me a cup of water, who did give me something to drink, who did clothe me or visit me in prison, you know, you'll go to, go to heaven. I said, well, when, do we, when do we see you, Lord? When, when, when do we do those things? They said, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And so it's important for us to realize that the way we treat other people says something about our relationship with God. Yes? Absolutely. And I think, that's, I think that's what this passage is alluding to. And so if we judge um, with wrongful judgment, you know, it's kind of like Matthew 7, 1, you know, you can't judge. It's not what it says there, right? You can't judge partially. You can't judge wickedly. And if we do, then it's kind of hard to judge wickedly your entire life and then expect God to judge you uh, in a favorable light in eternity. And so we've got to be careful of that. Uh, some takeaways for today. Number one, the relationship between James 2 and Matthew 7, I think, is, is a pretty fascinating relationship. Uh, number two, looking deeper than the surface level. I mean, it's natural for us to look surface level. We've got to be deeper than that. It, it, it transcends uh, culture. It transcends what we are maybe impulse to do, but that's the call of Christianity. Number three, we've got to love all. No partiality, no prejudice. Uh, what color they are, how much money they have in the bank account, doesn't matter. Christ died on the cross for them. They're worth saving and they're worth reaching out to. Number four, merciful and compassionate to all. Uh, if we're not, then we are transgressing God's law and we are standing outside the grace of Christ. And so we've got to be sure we're doing those things. Uh, we're out of time, and uh, thank you so much for your attendance, your questions and comments. We had a wonderful, wonderful crowd this morning, and uh, let's close the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for the grace and the kindness that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us as your people to be individuals that judge impartially, to be individuals that look at others not as a monetary worth or a status or a race, but as individuals who were worth enough for your Son, our Savior, to die on the cross for and worthy enough for us to reach out to with love and honor and respect that they too might understand and know the compassion of your Son and the grace and the salvation that can be found through Him. 
Please help us to be uh, instruments sharing the gospel to those people and help us to be examples to them in all of our lives here in this community and throughout the world. Please watch over us and bless us. In your name we pray. Amen.